up on the Leah Andrews Show, an interview with acknowledged Native elder Joseph Graywolf, owner of Walk and Balance Center Incorporated. Welcome to the Leah Andrews Show. I am very happy to welcome Joseph Graywolf. He is an acknowledged Native elder, and he's also the owner of Walk and Balance Center Incorporated. Walk and Balance Center Incorporated. Welcome, Joseph. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you, Leah. Um, I really wanted to have Joseph on because he was a huge influence in my life. I had an experience back in September with Joseph Raylof and with Carissa Schumacher on a journey in Sedona. And it was a time that I was really going through a lot of things. And it really helped to heal my heart and bring me back um, to connect with myself. And so I wanted to talk a little bit about that, about your journeys that you do here in Sedona. Well, the last one that, that we did we went to the birthing cave, and that was an incredible journey because we really found that we needed to listen. Remember, we were walking the trail, yep. and next thing you know, you were walking, going, where are we? And then we had to stop and breathe and, and look, and, and the journey to get there was so much a part of the journey. <clears throat> um, here in, in Sedona, there, there is so much of that spiritual journey here. It's like you arrive here, feel it as, as you have been as really people from around the world that have come here to sometimes not even know why but to come to some answers of what it is that is drawing them spiritually to want to experience what is here in Sedona as it goes for you and many others. Mm -hmm. Where we are right here right now is sacred ground where we hold many different ceremonies. There's medicine wheel behind us. There's a, a lodge here where we perform some very traditional ceremonies, EDP purification ceremonies, and dances. You know, we have children, moms and dads, and grandmas and grandpas here. We do figure eight dancing, we do Cherokee dancing, my wife is Cherokee. So not only do we hold the seven sacred ceremonies of, of many indigenous peoples, what is important for us is to connect no matter where we are on this walk and to us come together and dance. Now, I know that for me, it was, it's been a fascinating thing for me to come into your teachings because I, there's so much dignity and, and power in your, your Native American um, ceremonies and your teachings. And I think that a lot of us in the modern world have seen Native American nations as kind of broken people. And what I think is really beautiful about coming into here is that there's nothing broken. I mean, there was a horrible thing that were done, and it's still alive, and it still can be brought back. And um, can you speak a little bit about that? It, did you go through that? Did you go through that process yourself as a Native American person, um, knowing about history, and then kind of rediscovering the power in it? So through mom and dad, grandmas and grandpas, from the time that we arrived here as little children, that were first helped by mother, by father, by grandpa, by grandma, by relations, we start to receive um, teachings or lessons. And when we're first held, we are so open to everything that is being said to us, the actions that are being given to us, the love prayerfully that, that's being extended that we just take it all because we're little wild animals and we're mm -hmm. so ready for it all. And then as we grow, say now we start going into school, so we're into like an adolescent school. And now we're in school. Maybe it was Catholic school. Other ways of raising right? There's some other sort of schooling, but the important part of realization of schooling is teaching. So what we're taught is we Times of our lives 
where we're really asking questions about those teachings that were given to us, what of those do I need to keep? What of those teachings, if it was um, boarding school or if it was Catholic school, if it was, however that was, what teachings within that are holding us back from stepping out into who we are? Because truly, who are we? We're spirit people that are holding on to crap, stuff, uh -huh. however you want to express it. Uh -huh. That's a physical blow or an emotional hurt or a, um, a spiritual not knowing or, or a mental worry, fear thing that we may have been holding on to since we, as we came in as little children. Or maybe even before that. Because before we came in, we came in with ancestral knowings that we are now Look at all this. We're, we're shutting our eyes more. We're breathing in more of purposeful breath, not just the breath that brings us life, that helps our blood, but to really breathe with our eyes shut. Love and gratitude of letting go of some of the stuff that's going as well. So I think for each of us, we can say that uh, from what has been, there's this stuff that we're holding on to that's not serving us. And as we've talked about before, and as we talked about our journey, is that when we acknowledge what those negative worry, fear-based stuff is really causing us pain, it's not a disease, it's a dis-ease of whatever it is that we're feeling. Now looking at what can we do to help support ourselves with physical embodiment so that our, our spirit is um, clear, cleansed, purified in, in what is with the mind. So I know that's a big answer. Yeah, there's no, so much more. I love it. <laughs> so I'm, uh, I'm fanning uh, some medicine. It's, it's really important as we uh, come into a ceremonial way that uh, we have some medicines available to uh, help you cleanse and clear and let go. So, in the abalone shell, the abalone shell itself is a recognition of water. Water being the blood of our Mother Earth. Water then represented by the shell of water that flows through us that brings life. And then within the shell is sage, that is the feminine medicine. Cedar is the masculine medicine. And with the sweet grass, it's the medicine. Ways of ceremony, which is every day. When we wake up in the morning of the day and we're in loving gratitude to divine creator, God, however we want to express divineness, then we're combining that feminine masculine and masculine together. So we're going to keep that kind of going. Mm -hmm. One thing I love about your teachings is it's not just about it's very similar to Taoism. Mm -hmm. Because Taoism is also an earth based philosophy, medicine, religion, however, spirituality, however you want to term it. Um, so there's this reverence for natural cycles, natural, having rituals within their natural cycles, and also the balancing of the masculine and feminine, balancing of all of the elements of nature together. And one of the ways that you speak, which I love, is that you call uh, plant people stirring them. So there's this acknowledgement of consciousness and all living. When, when Creator created creation, it was done with a breath, and that breath of love, and then creation was set upon. This came through a vision, I, I just loved it, I, I could see it with my eyes shut, I could see this happening. It was a breath. And set upon creation were stone people, tree people, four-legged people, the creepy crawly people, the swimming people, the cloud people, all people, all one. And set here with a specific purpose. Just as we are right here, right now, sitting right here with a specific purpose. And that is to help and assist here. We don't own it. We don't own it. 
we're caretakers, okay? So as caretakers, and sitting with all people, as we speak truth and with love and gratitude of shutting off what is not ours, we connect with the spirit of all people. And I've noticed too that when I sit with those from Japan or from Europe or wherever it is, whatever spirituality they may be in, uh, in the sacred world, not fanatical with it, because once we get fanatical, then it all goes to, you know, what in the hand basket. Right. So we want to be, <laughs> but acknowledging that, you know, the, the intermingling, like the web of life, um, which is part of what, what the Lodge is all about, this represents the womb of our mother. So what is below is also above, what is above is below. And it's intermingling with willows, tied together naturally, and forming the womb of our mother, which is where we're sitting right here. And this, by the way, you, you have corrected me, this is not a sweat box. No. The correct term? Initi, purification ceremony. So that's within the Lakota, Dakota, N Nakota no wings. In Cherokee, it would be called in a sea purification ceremony. Now, through history, it has been called a sweat lodge. What happened with that is that it was taken uh, to places and, uh, and, and not set, prepared, and worked in a sacred way. So why it is that here at Walk and Balance, we refer to the ceremonies in a spiritual way is to then not be connected here to others who are not doing things in a traditional spiritual way. So we refer back to the teachings of the ancestors of what truly what should be called. And even if we just call it a purification ceremony, it says a lot more than sweat lodge. When I lived up in northern Minnesota, and I used to have uh, saunas. Mm -hmm. You know, we'd go in there and we'd have the eucalyptus branches yes. and looking at ourselves and, oh, it smelled so good. And we'd run out in the snow. Mm -hmm. Or at one time, I remember we lived by a lake. So we'd cut this big hole in there and we'd run out and dive in the cold water and then go back into the sauna. Then came the Inipi, and we would do the same thing. How powerful. Well, as you know, you were, you were in, uh, you've been in two of us, sir. Yes. Yeah. It was incredible. The thing I want to say about your Anipi ceremony, it was very physically gentle. I mean, you go through a lot of spiritual, emotional, mental stuff, which is why you go there. Um, but it's such a loving, gentle space where I have had experiences where it's a little bit more physically intense. Sure. Um, I mean, it still was, you get a nice sweat and, and you get a full experience, but it wasn't as uh, grueling. Um, because you, you do things more gently. With your, your rituals. The time of suffering is over. Thank you. I love that. <laughs> Can you say that again? <laughs> I want to hear them. <laughs> the time of suffering is over. Yes. So, this it's not that there isn't purpose. In, say we're going to have a purification ceremony for a particular purpose. Like, um, someone's crossed over the other side of camp. Uh, someone's really sick. There's prayers needed for whatever that might be, and there's a purpose and there's an intent. Then, when we go into the lodge and we're sitting there in the stones of the Glen Hot and, and we're listening, and if I'm going to be pouring, pouring the water in the ceremony, my purpose is to listen to what it is that Creator, Divine Source, has to come through. And Creator might say, You know those 28 stones you have out there that you might bring in at seven times, maybe around? Bring them all in at once. But the purpose and the intent then is to listen how to work with those stone people, how to work with those grandfathers, what is needed within the healing that is necessary for whatever the purpose is. Um, but the time of suffering is over. It's, it's not about seeing how hot we can get it. It's not about seeing how long we stay. Because as you know, some are getting out and having water and water brought in and water being thrown around. It, it's about prayer. It's about purifying oneself through prayer, through songs, through laughter, through tears, however that is, so that then from being inside the womb of our mother in that way, when you come out, it's, it's like you're all shiny and, and ready. Kind of like when you came out of, out of your mom. We'll never have another mom. 
They only have one mom. So this is is uh, that recognition of, of the womb of our mother, which is above the place. I don't know if you want to bring this up, but one thing I thought was fascinating about you, you actually were in the, the priesthood, at least, the seminary at least, you didn't actually become a priest, but you started off being in the seminary. Well, I started off being in Catholic school all the way through eighth grade. Mm-hmm. So that was my knowing. Um, it, it wasn't a question of do I want, it was that I was. So it, it was again that, that for me, as I look back, it, it was, you know, the thumbs and down on you. So mm-hmm. when I got out of eighth grade, I was going to public school. I remember my first day of school. It was like the the scariest thing I've, I had ever done because um, I had no idea what was going on. Um, it, it wasn't a part of my life. And so when I came back home after that first day, I told my mom and dad, I said, I'm not going back there. What do you want to do? I said, I don't know. I'm not going back in that public school. Mm-hmm. So I said, I know. I'll go in the seminary. Well, my mom's doing high fives with God. Dad's on your mom. Good thing. So I did. I went to the uh, seminary and, and studied for quite some time and had an opportunity to really read some books. Mm-hmm. Books that were not available to us as we were even in the, in, in the church. Uh, and what I found really beautiful, and what really brought me to this question, is that within those books, I was reading, We Are All One. So as I continued to read that and accept that, I went to the head, like, priest guy. And I said, Father, he goes, my son. I said, in all the books I've been reading, it says we're all one. Yes, my son. I said, well, then why does it have to be this one? And he said, you'll be leaving now. (laughs) So within that acceptance, and of course I went into public school, Mm -hmm. well, I'll have a (laughs) book. So what, so what brought you back? Like, what brought you back to where you were now doing these ceremonies? After raising four children, working uh, as an engineer, mm-hmm. um, you know, really being involved in that, if man doesn't work seven days a week, 24 hours a day, how will you possibly support a family? How will you have a four-bedroom house and all the toys in. Oh, by the way, you're not going to get to use them, but you're going to have them. And, th- and that was my life. I remember my son Colin was five or six. And I, I had come home early on a Saturday. And I came in the front door and he ran from me. He didn't even recognize me. That that was how it was, you know. And I had to go to them. And mothers are going, no, no, it's, it's your dad. He didn't even know. And that was a really big awakening. It was time to really start letting go of what was holding me back from being there for my children, from being there for my wife, from being there for all my relations. Um, And it was a difficult road because instilled within me, as it is in many men, is that uh, we're we're the ones that provide. And uh, it's time to get off of it. It's not true. The women, the grandmas, are our mood. You guys are. Incredible move. That's so beautiful because, in in way of, of tribalness, really, if, if you look at, at tribalness around the world, men would go to grandmas, men would go to the women, and they would sit, and they would then speak about whatever it was that was important, whatever it might be. And then once the grandmas and, and the mothers spoke, they would go back and they would talk about it. But there was no decision making until you talked to the women. And so the feminine is on this incredible move where now you hold as women maybe half the workforce. But what is more beautiful than that is givers of life, as we of Wakar, sacred women, to be acknowledged for who you truly are. And you should be acknowledged first. And in a ceremonial way, when, when you enter into, you acknowledge women first. And then, hey, my brother, how are you? So, when did it start? It was all there, but my awakening was my son running from me and not running from us. That's amazing that you say that. I didn't know this story, but I see you with your, he has a, you have a younger son now, who is such a light being. And he 
people are so present. I mean, that all children could have a father as loving and present, which I think, thank God now, more men are, are finding that they they should and they can have their heart with them, be present, and not just a source of money. And like, that's not their only goal. It's like, it's, it's, like, it's, 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 it's being present. children that have so much to teach. I remember there was a time ago when a friend of ours, Kristen, called and was coming here to Sedona and was, may we just sit? And I'm like, yeah, Kristen, where are you? I'm over at the coffee shop. See, I thought she was in Tucson coming this way. No, she's at the coffee shop. So Josh and I were out traveling around. And I said, well, I got Josh with me. She said, bring him. So there we are, we're sitting up at a coffee shop and uh, Kristen and I are talking. Josh is having a lemonade. He takes a sip of his lemonade, and he goes, Kristen, she goes, yes, Joshua. He says, what happens when you, this is what he did, when you draw a line? She goes, I don't know, goes, I don't know Josh, what happens? So it goes on forever. He's drinking his lemonade. She's looking at me, and we're talking. Kristen, yes, Joshua. What happens when you draw a line right alongside that other line? She goes, oh, Joshua, I don't know what happens. He said, it'll go on forever, but somewhere down the road, it will cross. And he got up and walked away. And Kristen looks at me and says, what the hell is that? <laughs> I needed that because what was happening in her, in her life is that she was coming to a crossroads. And, and where do you go from there? You know, how do you how do you set with the oneness when, when you know that uh, that crossroads is, is difficult? Uh, you know, you bring all this stuff into it when, when really we need to embrace it. So there was Joshua's teaching. It was just awesome. So, uh, oh, by the way, so over the last while, I know I shared a little bit about this, but now that we're at children, um, I called some of my favorite kids, and they were in the school that Joshua goes, he's in a Waldorf school, so I just called some of the kids with a question. I said, I'm going to be interviewed tomorrow, and I want to know some things to share. So would you give me one word that would express what it is that makes you happy? The first child I talked to, who was nine, said dinosaurs. And so I had to ask him, I said, well, why dinosaurs? He goes, well, from what I've been hearing, it's kind of like us. And I go, well, what do you mean by that? He goes, well, you know, they're extinct. I'm like, yeah. He said, well, that's what could happen if we continue doing some of the stuff we're doing, right? <laughs> I'm like, okay, th that's true. However, if we look at it as there are swimming people and four-legged people and bird people that are right here right now that are part of the ancestry of the dinosaurs. So they are living on. So, oh, I hadn't thought about that. So there, anyway, there was this connection. The next child said music. She said the music of vibration is how she put it. Wow, the music is so important for us. Um, I know you've heard me sing. I know you've sang together in Lodge. And, and uh, I used to sing my best when I was in the shower because nobody could hear me. Uh -huh. um, but now I love to sing. Mm -hmm. and, and it's not just singing something with words. It's just lifting vibration of sound to enhance the vibration of, of our breath, mm -hmm. of expression. I like that. So music was a great answer. Then I asked Joshua, 
And he said, friends. And he said, you know, Dad, we can never have enough of them. I was like, yeah, Josh, you're much you're right. We can never have enough friends. And so being that, that we're all friends, in one way or another, we're all holding hands. One of the other expressions was self, self-worth. That came from my 38-year-old daughter, who's going through a lot of stuff, of the letting go, you know, things that haven't worked out, and now perfectly stepping into the stuff that will work out. But in order to do that, we have to find self-worth. If we don't love ourselves, we, we wouldn't be having this conversation like that. So, in recognition of the children, oh yeah, there's a little brother Raven flying by. Mm-hmm. Love the ravens, there's two of them. They're all about the magic. Mm-hmm. This is all about magic. So as we stir the pot, and we're putting in all this, all this good stuff, and we're holding hands. You know, if, if all of us just put our hands out and, and just shut our eyes, and breathe in some deep love and gratitude, and hold hands, you know, like, like put a wolf over here, and maybe a cat over here, and put your hand over here, and, Actually, you know, we're holding hands with a tree person, a cloud person, holding hands with your mom over there, and, and we're all holding hands and we're just loving it and turning slow. That's the way life is. That's the way it should be. That's the beat of this heart. That's the beat of this heart is in communion with, is becoming one with the drumbeat of the universe. And so when, when this is, is beating and setting that, that water through us, we're really connecting that with the spirit of who we are. You, know, it's like, you can make a noise with whatever you like, and that goes as far as, wow, who knows how far, mm-hmm. farther than we ever know. Mm-hmm. But so does the breath. You know, this breath goes just like the smoke farther than we ever know. So the connecting with the children has been so profound for me the last few days. The answers that have come through from my granddaughter Piper, who's she's just younger than Josh. Josh was actually in Hong Kong. Um, she said, that. And "It's all about it. love. Is the most powerful force there." And then we look at some of the stuff. Came up from Tucson. Yes. So just south of there, in the Carlos Apache, down in the Superstition Mountains. There was just signed into being a bill that would devastate thousands of acres that would be turned into a copper mine. So there's a lot of a lot of our relations that are down there saying, no, stop! You know, we don't want this. There's a company in India who wants to open up a um, hotel with assorted um, businesses, uh, restaurants, and that at the bottom of the Grand Canyon. No, stop that! There's uranium mining that's scheduled for the bottom of the Grand Canyon. There's coal mining going up here in northern Minnesota, and there's stuff happening. All I mean, there's XL pipelines that are wanting to be stretched across the United States, and yet they don't even look at. 50,000 gallons of oil that's spilled into the Yellowstone, okay? And people can't drink the water. I was at a birthday party. Let's see, Josh was uh, nine. It was a beautiful, at, at a park we had. And so we arrived, we were going to set up the tables, and we realized that there's like six birthday parties going on. So we're going to have ours on the grass. So we laid out blankets, we had all the food out there. And of course, what the kids want to do, they want to go play. Yes. So they're all playing around, having a great time, and there's music going on, and we're dancing. And, and we were sitting on a blanket, and I look up, and I see like a checkerboard affair going on within the realm of chemtrails. I watch. And then I hear, oh no, look what you did, oh, this is terrible. And I look, and there's six helium balloons of different colors floating up into the sky. And mother's all upset because the young child let go of them, they're going up into the sky. Mm-hmm. So obviously, some are looking up there at these incredible, beautiful balloons and also seeing 
there's crisscrossing lines in the sky. But what are they acknowledging? But they're acknowledging the blues. So I said, what would happen if we gathered all the children that we gathered all the moms and all the dads and all the grandmas and all the grandpas and all the relations that are here and had us all stand in a line and just yell, STOP! Do you think they'd do it? Because we're afraid of what others will possibly think. Yes. That's why. And we have this incredible voice. Those that are down at the Carlos uh, stuff going on down there, they're down there saying no. They're making their noise, they're waving their fans, they get a lot of medicine going on down there. They're all hugging each other in prayers that others will assist them. Now to do that, we don't have to go there. We shut our eyes and just connect with our breath of our heart and hearts. A sense of prayer there. Can you, I mean, I mean, you, but you gave me, in times when I've had some issues going up where I felt overwhelmed, how can I do, well, how can I act? And you gave me that beautiful, simple meditation where you breathe with in love and out gratitude. And that immediately, if I can get myself into that breath, I'll want to do, it's like I, I, it's like I, I get into that space done where I can actually take real action. Because sometimes when, like when you tell me the story, I start thinking, oh my God, this is horrible. How is this still going on? Yeah. How can people be so disconnected? And when I'm in that space, I'm not thinking straight. And I can't take right action. So can you have us go through that meditation real fast? Absolutely. So first we're going to do it with our eyes open so we can see it. Okay. And then we're going to go into it. So with, with our eyes open, if you take this finger, just so that you have a focal point, and you take this finger, and you put it on your nose. And you're breathing really deep long. As deep as you can, as much as you can, fill yourself a little. And then put your hands in front of your mouth and breathe out gratitude. Four of those breaths, every morning, I still do them. Every morning, breathing in love, gratitude, four breaths. Morning, sometime during the day. No, we can all just stop, turn from whatever we're doing, and just breathe in four deep breaths of love and with gratitude on that. And at nighttime before we go to sleep, so that we're open for our dream time, where we work more than we even do during the day, because our spirit now has a chance to go out and play around. Over my many years of, of this practice, I have found it to be the most healing, the most healing practice. And yet, it seems to ignite within us. It does. It, it ignites that fire. And, and through igniting of that fire, we then feel the heat of knowing how good it feels. So now we're going to shut our eyes. See, when, when you shut your eyes, you shut out all the perceptions of what you see. And we're so full of perceptions. We have our eyes open. So if we just take a moment to shut our eyes, we now shut out all the perceptions that we see. And we breathe in deep love. Exhale in gratitude. And listen. Breathe in love. And gratitude. Just listen. Deep love. And gratitude. I shut in deep love and gratitude, listening with our eyes shut. And with our eyes shut, the more that we listen, the more that we will come to understand. It's like these beautiful bird people that are around here right now and they're singing. They're talking. And the more that we do this practice, we will come to the knowings that we came in with as children that we all spoke the same language. And we will once again truly hear and understand what's on the wind. We'll truly hear what it is that our cat has to say. We will truly hear 
is what it is that Divine Creator Source has coming through us. Then, with one more deep love and gratitude, we open our eyes and we will truly see what it is that we ought to see. Now, another big part of that teaching is that the information that's coming through is like this big funnel at times, you know, where you have a funnel on top of it, you have so much coming down through you, into you, into your head, that it gets to where you just want to not have any more, and you start going crazy, which is a bad thing. I like this. <laughs> However, if, if we take the funnel and, and Get it more into like a hollow bone or a tube or a straw that runs straight through us. Right through our tree. We've got limbs like a tree. We've got our hair, that's our feelers out there. It's like the, the bits on the, the pine tree or the leaves on the tree. The trunk of our tree and our feet is connected to Mother Earth. So that hollow bone that's coming through us aligning, straightening all of our chakras, bringing in that clear light of oneness. When we do that breath work, it helps to align us. You know, then, then it feels really good, you know, sit up straight, because we're, we're in straight oneness with what it is that we're, that we're going to do. And when we acknowledge more, I don't know, I just feel like taking my shoes off. Anyway. Go ahead. <laughs> or take, take your hands, take your hands, put them down on Mother Earth, okay? Uh -huh. Give acknowledgement, okay? You know, the, the gratitude part of what we're doing when we're whew, gratitude, we're in gratitude of letting go of what it is that's not serving us anymore. So, okay. so, you might want to try this. This came to be a good tool for me when I was, um, before I retired, thank you, Craig. Um, <laughs> <laughs> in that when I was in business and, and stuff was really coming at me, and you, you know what I'm talking about, that I would just turn and I would go, and I flick my fingers down to Mother Earth, and I would let go of stuff. And then I was, oh, okay. so now what I do, and I just, you know, suggest it. You could have your own sound, but this is mine. I do like love, gratitude, because our spirit loves sounds. It loves to be acknowledged. It's like when I go right away, I can hear my spirit go, oh, good, he's like, close my crap. <laughs> yeah, you know, let it go. It's, it's not ours. You know, what is yours is not mine. What is mine is not yours. But here we are sitting together sharing the truth. Okay. And, and we're working together within our bubbles. The bubbles that they surround us. They're our aura, right? They're like bubbles. And each of us have them. And we sit inside of our bubble. We look out. You know, there, there's times when you really breathe love and, and gratitude and, and you're in that bubble. You might look at it as how clear it is or um, there's a scratch over there. Right? Or, uh, oh, there's a little mar over there. I, that. I do things in a clockwise way, which clockwise is you know, really charging it up. And then, you know, you're sitting in your bubble and you look around and, and there's someone in there when you just want your bubble to yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and, and you look in there and you go, what the heck are you doing to my bubble? <laughs> you know? And so, you know, you make a doorway uh -huh. and with love, yes, prayerfully, yes. would you please leave my bubble and, you know, with, you know, whatever. Thank you for being here and for being here and I really appreciate the time you had to share with us. Mm -hmm. And you might have to get a sword, you know, get the, get out of my bubble. And then once they're out of there, then this is the water, mm -hmm. life, okay, seal it back up. Mm -hmm. And so then when, when your bubble's all clear, your order's all set, and you really feel it like you're on it. And then you're walking down the street. And you're all ready for whatever it is. And someone walks by you and they feel that you're so ready that what do they do? They give you all their crap. So, <laughs> oh no, no, what is that? Oh, I really hear a lot. And we hold stuff without even knowing. Yes. You, know, you can get on the computer, phone call, you know, and, and you just let it go. And the next thing you know, you don't shit yourself. Yes. 
and, and you hurt. Yeah. And they have names for it. Cancer. <laughs> <laughs> All kinds of names. <laughs> they and them. Don't listen to them. Because they don't know what the hell they're talking about. They really don't. This is ours. It's us. It's we. Mm -hmm. and, and that's what helps the circle stay together. So, so what could we do to help this physical embodiment that's Holy Spirit? We've had some great interviews with people who talk about GMO foods and, and what to look at and, and numbers and, and all of this stuff. I'll guarantee you that no matter where you're sitting or standing or whatever you're doing right here right now, that around you live plant people who want to support you. Okay. So I want to share one. And most of us dig them up and throw them away because they're just a nuisance. Mm -hmm. I actually have that in my garden right now. I, I love candy. Dandelions. Oh, and you're all wilted. But you know what? They're still really good. And so if you take the leaves of the dandelions, and you can make a tea out of them, you can put them in a salad. What I like to do at times is, is I go get some really good like organic uh, turkey or whatever, and I make a sandwich with it. Mm -hmm. and avocados and and I'm not using Miracle Whip anymore. I'm into Veganese and mm. soy free. Yes. <laughs> My dad's over there going, yeah, I know you're not into the sauces anymore. But anyway. <laughs> and, and so anyway, they, they say that you should plant it because of the acidic and stuff, and I'm telling you. They're so tasty. <laughs> and they're so good for you. Dandelion. Mmm has within that plant medicine that will help every cell in your body, every bone of your structure. It'll help your capability to come to know what it is that you want to know, because it actually helps to, to clear and to cleanse this massive gray stuff that we call our mind, so that we can really truly come to know what it is that, that, that we're putting in there. Oh, but it does. I've been doing this for well, since I started coming in. It like Yes, it does. Oh, talk about our stuff. So, one other medicine that <clears throat> you can get at most health, most health, health food stores. Or you could go pick it, but you got to get up about 10,000 foot of Mountains like uh, Wolf Mountains in Montana. It's called Bear Root. Oh, that's what you know from the Navy ceremony. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's true. So that one's yours. Oh, thank you. So just smell. And, and it's, it's so amazing. earthy. Yes. I mean, it's, 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 it's called bear medicine because they say that if we ate everything the bears did, we'd never be sick. And the bears go for this stuff. I mean, they're out there. Where this grows is, so where the streams are, and then you got the rocks next to the streams, up comes this. Room. And this plant that looks like a well, this one. It's got these beautiful white flowers. Okay. So the bear's got to get down, they got to move the stones, and then they get the and they start eating. Now for me, what I like to find, so when you when you go buy the stuff, oh okay. So when you go buy it, if you get the really big ones like this, you got your coffee grinder, grind it up and make a tea, add a little bit of honey to it, and drink it all, the little fines, everything. And it's great for bronchitis, it's great for the throat, it's great for your sinuses. Yeah. You smell this, it, it feels like it's it's opening things oh, up. Oh yeah, it's absolutely. Just smell it. I look for these little ones like that. The smaller they are, the more comfortable they are. Uh -huh. So I take like just a pinch. Okay. okay. And once your water starts to combine with the medicine, it starts to get softer. And then you swallow the, the medicine. And there was this flu going around here that had people coughing and thought they were going to hack them in a lung. And I was like, here, and I, I like, was giving away ocean. Uh -huh. And having them make tea. And it's so good for anything that is bronchitis, lung, um, stuff, throat, sinuses. You know, when, when you're drinking your tea, how you would any other tea, you know, it smells it really smells so good. That is gorgeous. Yeah. I do want I think that the reverence that you have when you work with the plants, and most of people who work with medicine, 
when you have a reverence for, for what you use in your medicine, it works so much more because you're acknowledging what they've done for us. No matter what tool it is, I think it's a matter of it's a, you know, eagle fan or rattle. If it's um, some stone that calls to us because of this. And then we come into some knowings that then we start digging into some knowings. It's when we come to know it that we fall in love with it. But this one stone, for me anyway, I really want to be honest. This is what's so beautiful. Okay, so I'm in the house where it's kind of like a museum. And um, I said, okay, who would like to be out here for this coming together, right? Mm -hmm. And everybody's been going, I do, I do, I do, I've got hands up in here. Mm -hmm. I love that part because then I get to ask, okay, specifically who would like to be here. And so some of who are here is because of the listening and these really want to be here. In the expression of who we are as crystal beings, as crystal and light. And then of course there's the question. And that really speaks of the third eye, the pituitary organ. So right there away from the scene. <laughs> and I have a lot of And it helps to lift the vibration. So as Leah is holding in her left hand, she is now receiving. Her left hand is our receiving hand. So if, if we put more spirit to that, whenever we're, we're being given something, we've got our left hand receiving. crystal, there's a little water still sharing that. And within that knowing of that love, then when you put it into your right hand, that's your giving hang on. And you're giving that love. So, yeah, you're, you're right. You know, no matter what it is that we do with whatever tool or key that works, so that we can see it's a key, right? We're going to put it in the key and we're, and we're going to turn it off. Oh, oh, I'm to spirit now. This feels really good. So as we do that, as we receive some knowing from that, and then we're going to, to give energy out, that really is shutting off that 10% of, of how we look at stuff. Yes. And we, we step into that 90% of who we are. It's not that we're going to you know, dig out the brain and get rid of it altogether, because it, it helps us to really process what it is that, that we need to come to in some ways, it was just connecting to the child. Mm -hmm. And every, every being wants to be seen and held. Like a, a beautiful crystal like this isn't what you just walk on by. You want to go get into that child. Oh my God, this is so beautiful. That's what they're here for. It's to be acknowledged for that, right? You ever walk down by a stream though and you got all these stone people? Uh -huh. And every one of them wants to be touched. Yes. Yeah. It doesn't matter how beautiful, ugly, or in between they are, yes. they all want to be touched. Yes. And it's so important for us to touch as many as we can because with the energy that, that, that you're using right now with that one as you put it down, the energy that now flows there through you as you're giving is now connected to the spirit of this bunny rabbit. Mm -hmm. Who by the way wanted to be here with you too. Place you your hand on it. What's the first word? Gentleness. Gentle. Gentle. Soft. To remind us to be soft and gentle with our physical embodiment so that then we can come into the crystal clear knowing of who we are. So when we're soft and gentle with this physical embodiment, then we become then that vibration goes down into Mother Earth, and that vibration is connected to every root and every tree person. It's connected to every little creepy crawly person. It's then connected to every four-legged person, and every bird person, every, and, and sky people, and cloud people. Right here, right now, we're all connected. 
just doing that simple circle. So now the bare root starts to get really starts getting strong, right? So what we do is we breathe in. Pick up your hands. And breathe it in. It's complete cleanse. And if it gets to be too much, what we can do is take it down over it. And it gets really fibrous and just small. So what comes in? <laughs> I have a question for you because you, meeting you now, I didn't meet you in your former life where you were crazy like the rest of us running around in a hamster wheel. You're so present and being in your presence, you can't help but just be in the present moment and aware of all of our relations and connecting and how did you, do you have any advice for us who still are living in, for whatever reason, we still feel like we have to live with one foot in the rat race? We're still, we have children or we have to have a business or do you have any advice for how to live like this there? Most important is that as we are out doing what it is we need to do to pay the bills, what it is we're doing to help our kids, Outside of here lives that I used to say the heat of knowing or the fire of knowing. The more that we acknowledge what it is that makes our hearts sick, whatever that may be, you slowly come into the knowing of it's right here. It's right here right now. Um, we live a lot in what is going on out there. Find what it is that makes your heart sick. Uh, for those that are familiar with, um, with chakras, with um, with dealing with colors. As you look around here, you see seven colors. And they, they provide your representation of directions, but also colors that have, well, many meanings depending upon the tribal affiliation you're talking about. But just really quickly, okay? So the yellow is in recognition of the sunrise. So if you were to hang yellow, a strip of cotton, yellow, cotton, in your house, Right, you open the door, and there's a strip of yellow. It's about knowledge, teachings, bird people. Okay? It's about that first sound you hear in the morning when you come out and the birds are talking. It reminds us to shut our eyes. It reminds us to listen. It reminds us to love and gratitude for the opening of the day. Okay? The red is the north in representation of the blood of our Mother Earth. We also talk about buffalo. I like that, but primarily it's in representation of the red of the blood that flows through us beneath us. Black is the west, and it's about dream time. The white is south. The reason for that is that when the sun rises, and when it gets to its highest center point, it's the whitest white. And it represents the wisdom of the elders that have gone on before us. I think you may have heard me say, when our elders go south, and when they go south. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's that teaching that's been handed out from grandmas and grandpas that when someone crosses over, they go south, and that is into the whiteness of um, spirit. Blue, of course, is sky, sky people. Green, the earth, and purple, here, spirit. There are other colors that can really excite us. I know we've talked about orange. Mm -hmm. Orange is the color of the sacral. Orange is the color of womb, gut knowing. It's about creativity. So when we come in to create something, you might put your hands there and feeling this creativeness coming through, whatever that might be, acknowledge it and you might want to pick up a piece of orange crystal like. Um, a piece of, or an orange piece of cloth. 
to, to make recognition to you, create it. So when we create, we want to put it into the divineness. We want it to flow through us. So we take that orange creative breath and we put it to purple of divineness and then we bring it to the blue of throat and then we express oration. Creative, divine oration. Oration can be not only something that, that we say, it can be an oration of something we draw. It could be a creation of something that, that we put together. It's all about creating and then orating it in a purple way. And being in gratitude for gifts that are freely given. Our Creator gives us these incredible gifts every day. There's physical gifts, spiritual, emotional, and mental gifts that give freely every day to us. If we just acknowledge them, then we will find through divine source what it is that makes us happy. How to walk this walk, dance this dance. How to make relations like we're all doing. And how to listen to the children. Not only the little ones that are around here, but this child. So that we come into a steadfast knowing that this is it. This is true. This is love. Grandma said, You know, Joseph, there's one thing that you need to know. After all these teachings that you and grandpas and grandmas and relations know, mm -hmm. I'm sure you're going to tell me that there's one thing. Oh, please, Grandma, tell me what that would be. And she said, Joseph, and I say you, pray. Love you. Oh, that's all it is. Mm -hmm. One thing that has been really profound coming here on Journeys with You is seeing this land from the truth about this land instead of what we were necessarily taught in the tourism guides and even in history. One of the examples was, my mom loves the story about the Sanagua people that you told us. Can you tell us about the Sanaguans? Our children are going to have a rough time with it, absolutely. I mean, as we did too, because we had history books. And let's really be honest here, what most is written in there is, is not the truth. It's all been interpreted in some ways, but we took it. Oh, well, so when the Spanish arrived here about 1,500 years, there was nobody living there. So if you go to the ruin sites like Montezuma as well, or these places, you'll see where the dwellings are in the stone. And you won't see a lot of Pueblo dwellings around here because they were torn down by the Spanish in search of gold. But they're standing there. How do these people live here? There's no water. Because there was this great drought, just like there have been in South America so before, that's why they came here. Now, they're gone. There's no water. How could they live? Sin agua. No water. So in the history books now, there's recognition made to the Sanaguan people. Mm -hmm. The Sanaguan language. The Sanaguan way of life. And even Joshua goes, this is just ridiculous. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, yeah, Joshua, this is ridiculous. You can't even tell the truth. So... <laughs> There were no Sanaguans living here. <laughs> they actually had names. <laughs> My Hopi brother and sisters were we were just at over the weekend uh, helping to put a roof on. When I was first talking to grandfather so many 13, 14 years ago, he said, you know, Joseph, our ancestors have been coming down where you are for 3,000 years. I said, 3,000 years? He goes, yeah, that's just where you were. He said, in the migration of people from South America that, that came to where you are, we've been wandering around there for thousands and thousands of years. That's not in the history books. What I love about grandmas and grandmas is that they have a great sense of humor. But when it comes to really wanting to share some knowing, we just listen. We can learn some, some incredible knowings of truly what was going on a thousand years ago. A thousand years ago, the pyramids were being built. Machu Picchu was at its highest and there were people living here. And before
Well, that the hunter gathers are out in Verde Valley hunting mammoths and sick tigers. Speaking about storage, can you tell us a story about uh, white buffalo? Because that's a that's a really beautiful sacred story that's that's told in relation to the um, how do you say it? I don't want to say peace pipe or something disrespectful. What I would love to do in regards to that story mm -hmm. is whoever has a sudden moment of intuitive realization mm -hmm. or an epiphany. I'd like to come here. I'd like to go to some of these sacred places, like Shams Cave, or other places. And come with Leo, or come with me, or come by yourself, or whatever that is. And we go to a sacred place, and I will bring the sacred pipe, and we will smoke. Not that funny stuff that people think I smoke in there. <laughs> there will be a whole different there, crowd there's, coming. There's actually, you know, <laughs> it's all herbs, no funny stuff. And we will go to these sacred places, and then I would express the story. Okay. And what I really love about that story is to have shared it with a woman who would tell the story. Because it's about white buffalo cat pipe woman. So in honor of the women, the story should be told in that way. Mm -hmm. uh, some of some of my ancestors and grandmas and that, you know, they, they tell the story. And um, and I'm fine with that. But for me there are there are certain pieces of sharings I really feel I should be shared. Woman, grandma, in that. It, it brings the power space. in sacred space. And other stuff too. Okay. Fair enough. Fair enough. Okay. Do you come and join us? Do you well, join you? Do you do you have anything that you in closing want my viewers to leave? With? All that we have talked about, again, for me, sharing with you, with all of There are so many tools and so many teachings that we can really get wrapped up into so much. If we just come to breathe in love, Exhale gratitude. Leaving it all alone, what is this not serving us any longer? And connecting with that breath of life, we can make a difference. And we can make a difference right here, right now, for our children and our children's children. Share the breath. Share that it there's none of this that is not possible. There's absolutely nothing that is going on that we cannot assist and to heal. But what it's going to take is a lot of breath and a lot of prayer and holding hands and when we can become active, become a part, sign the petitions that you see, make knowing of it. They know who we are already. So to sign a petition or to start one, to lift your voice, to share truth, will bring healing to all people. So I hope talk with us all my relations. I hope it is so. Thank you so much, Joseph. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Mom. If you enjoyed this interview, join us for a wonderful journey in April and Sedona. Rita's going to be there, and so will I.